Uh, first up is Bella. Uh, Bella, uh, she's, she's Austrian, right? Despite the last name, Deutsch. Uh, she's a PhD student at the University of Edinburgh and uh, she mostly uses Bayesian statistics for, uh, for her applied research work. And uh, she has a background from the University of Vienna and Oxford, and also has work experience working in from marketing to museum pedagogy, so lots of stuff. And she co she is co-founder of the Piscopi Initiative to encourage women and non-binary students to consider PhD in mathematics, and, and currently serves as a student trustee on the boards of directors of Edinburgh University Students Association. So, well, congratulations for all your achievements so far, first of all. And uh, the stage is yours. Um, I'd say. 20 minutes, if that's if that's okay. Um, we can take questions at the end of each talk, if you like, uh, and then and then proceed to to the next speaker. Thanks, Bella. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, just give me a minute until I figure out if I'll. All right. So, can you see my uh, screen? Yeah. Screen? Perfect. Thank you so much. All right. Beautiful. So thank you very much for having me and thank you everyone for coming to the talk. If you watch this as a recording, um, there's going to be ways to get in touch with me afterwards. So if you have questions, please do feel free to get in touch. For everyone else who's attending, same thing. If there's something else you think about afterwards, please do get in touch. So what I'll be talking about today is the ABC of ABC, a handy guide to approximate Bayesian computation. So Bayes, Bayesian statistics has something to do with Bayes theorem and luckily the Guardian has provided us with the perfect entry to any kind of Bayesian statistics talk you'll probably hear in the next couple of years because they've posted this beautiful article that went quite viral on Stats Twitter calling Bayes theorem that you can see on the right here the obscure math theorem and to be honest in my world at least it's not obscure at all I think it's rather quite neat. So what Bayes' theorem allows you to do, this is the thing on the right here, is that you can play around with conditional probabilities. So when we know the probability of B given A, with a little bit of math, we can get to the probability of A given B. And that's really all that matters for now on what Bayes' theorem is. So what I'll be doing today is I will give you a short introduction of Bayesian statistics, what that is and why you might want to use it. And then I'll have a quick chat about how you can actually do that. There's a lot of different ways out there. Some of them involve more math than others. And I'll show you one way to do at least approximate Bayesian computation. And um, you will be able to do that with just five things in one for loop in R. And I'll show you how to do that. All right, so let's get started on the first part. What is Bayesian statistics? So if you've done statistics in some form or another, maybe in your degree, maybe in your work, you probably, or maybe you've used frequentist statistics. That's the classical branch of statistics. And all the things like t-tests and f-tests all come from frequentist statistics. The idea there is that we have one true parameter value. And all we really want and can do is to see where this parameter value lies. Is the true mean zero or is it not zero? That's really all we can ask. And sometimes that's okay and that's all we can really do. Um, but as I said, crucial assumption here, parameters are fixed and have one value. And Bayesian statistics now comes in and has a different assumption. Here we assume that parameters themselves also have a distribution. This is quite fundamental. It changes the way we think about parameters and it also changes the way we deal with our data. Because in Bayesian statistics, we need to do a three-step procedure, the prior data posterior steps. I'll walk through them in some detail. Don't worry about the math too much. As I said, I'll show you ways around that. But if you want that, if you want that math part, I'm um, happy to chat about it afterwards. And there's a lot of great literature out there to deal with that kind of thing. All right. So if we do Bayesian statistics, we first start off without any kind of data. We first have to find a prior assumption about our parameter. So this is specified by, by a distribution of our parameter that we generally think makes kind of sense. It has to be big, it has to be very big, but it is something that we know in the real world of our parameter. That might sound rather obscure to you, but in a lot of applications, this may actually, makes actually a lot of sense. 
For example, if we'd want to model the height of people in, per, in centimeters on Earth, I think we could agree their mean would lie somewhere between 0 and 300. Or in the case that I've pictured here, here we talk about um, the, uh, the coin flip example. So we want to talk about the probability that any given coin, maybe a one euro coin that I found in my purse, the leftover from when I was living in Europe, um, is um, giving us tail. So I think we can all agree it will be somewhere around 0.5. It might be a little smaller, it might be a little larger. Maybe you remember one article that the Belgium one euro coin is slightly biased depending on the way you flip it. So anything around 0.5 is all right, maybe not too large, maybe not too little, big enough. And we can put that in a beta distribution and it will look something like the thing you see here on the left. And only once we've got that, we go ahead and collect our data. So we flip our coin, maybe 10 times. And seven of those gave us tail. Now, do you really think that this coin is biased? Well, probably not. That sounds pretty reasonable to me. So what we do now, we've got the prior, we've got the data, we put them together, this is where the math happens, and you look um, at the posterior distribution that you can see on the right. Crucially, this posterior distribution is again a distribution of our parameter. And because we only have so little data, it is only ever so slightly shifted to the right because we've got a few more tails and heads. Now, if we collected a thousand samples and 700 of them actually gave us head, so the same ratio, uh, gave us tails, so the same ratio, we would want a much bigger shift in the posterior distribution because we collected a lot more data. And that is actually something that we would see as well. What is important here is that our posterior uh, our posteriors are distributions of our parameter. And this allows us, first of all, to look at it, which is great. We love visualizations um, and you can really see the shape of the posterior distribution. Maybe it's bimodal for whatever reason. That would be really interesting to look at. But we can also make probabilistic statements about our parameters that sound something like a confidence interval, but are not. They are, for example, we can say there's a 95% chance that the mean lies between this and such value. This sounds like a confidence interval, but a confidence interval has a slightly different definition. If this is something you chat, want to chat about, um, I'm happy to do that later on. But we'll um, just remember for now, Bayesian statistics is great because we can actually quantify the uncertainty of our parameters in such a way. It has a very natural interpretation. On top of that, we can put knowledge into our model. In a lot of applications, especially when we talk about physics, we see that our parameter might have a small range that it can lie in, but we don't really want to fix it. And in frequentist statistics, we've got one of two options. Either we fix it and it's certain, or it's completely unknown. And Bayesian statistics allows you to get into that middle ground to say, oh, we've got a prior distribution. We've got a lot of reason to make it rather small, um, but we can put that model knowledge into our, that world knowledge into our model. Generally, this kind of setup allows you to be very versatile and to cater to the needs of your model and your questions. You can do funky things like having hierarchical priors <clears throat> where your, your data comes from a distribution that has parameters that themselves come from distribution and so on and so forth. Sounds a little bit crazy, but works really well in application. You might say, though, well, Bayesian statistics sounds fun, but we want to do statistics because we want to be objective. And that sounds rather objective, putting prior knowledge into our model. And yes, we do put things into our model that don't just come from the data. But we do that with good reasons, because those are things that we inherently know from being human and living and working in this kind of field. So those are actually things that we know. And we have to be sufficiently weighed for them to actually um, for, for this to be a valid procedure. So we want to be vague about it. We just want to get the grand truth of into our model. And I would argue that also in frequent statistics, you do make a lot of assumptions. But in Bayesian statistics, on the contrary, you have to be extremely transparent and have to argue for those assumptions. Whereas frequent statistics, I think at least, sometimes allow you to sweep them under the rug and you kind of can ignore them. One thing why Bayesian statistics might not be that cool is because it is computationally burdensome and there is no really way around it. It will take more time. There's great tools out there that help you in doing so, but it will be more expensive to compute. There's no way around it. Generally, at least for me, it's a very, very practical tool that works well in my research and in a lot of applications. It is 
just something else. And sometimes maybe you just want to do your t-test to see if you've got significant differences. And that's okay. But sometimes you might come across a problem that can be really well solved in data statistics. So hopefully, I've now convinced you that data statistics is something fun to look at. So now I'll show you a way how to do that in R in a rather simple way. So I talked about this prior data posterior step and omitted some of the marking bits in here. So if you look, if you um, see equation one, we talk about the prior being a function of the parameter and then a likelihood. This is a function of our data given a parameter. And this is precisely where Bayes' theorem becomes, comes in because this multiplied together is proportional to the posterior distribution, which is the flipped conditional probability of the parameter given the data. So this is where Bayes' theorem comes in. This is why everything is called Bayesian statistics. And when we usually do Bayesian statistics, we have to do the math to get to this posterior distribution. We have to have to write down the likelihood that is a function of the data. For example, this here would be um, the likelihood for the binomial coin flip example that I mentioned earlier. Sometimes, for example, in my research, there are ways where we can't evaluate that because there's an infinite number of integrals behind each other and we really can't do that. Sometimes it's hard to write down. Sometimes we just can't be bothered. And that's totally okay because there's a way around it. And this is approximate Bayesian computation, ABC, the thing I'm going to tell you more about now. Let's think that we have observed a data set Y. This is the thing that you've gotten out of your experiment. And we think that this is driven by some underlying parameter theta. So we need to have an idea about our data generating process. This is quite crucial here. And we need to be able to sample from that, but more on that in a minute. We only really make one underlying assumption, and that's a rather sensible one, I'd argue. If we have two data sets, we sit, and those are close, whatever close might be in your case, we'll come to that later as well. So if you have two data sets that are rather close, then we hope that the parameters that generated those two data sets are also rather close. And we'll utilize that idea in approximate Bayesian computation by saying, well, well, we'll generate lots of data sets, and the ones that are close, those parameters, we'll pick them as the posterior distribution. And this sounds very simple, but it actually works. And it gives you a good approximation to the posterior distribution. And for some examples, you can actually prove that this will converge to the true posterior distribution in distribution under some assumptions. Not important right now. All you need to know it, all you need to know here is it works. So what do we need to do? I mentioned earlier there's precisely five things that we need in R to make this work. Now, obviously, there's a lot of different ways to do Bayesian statistics in R. There's really great ways to do it. For example, in Stan, that has a great implementation in R Studio. Um, there's packages on ABC out there. But this is really just to show you what ABC is. And if you just want a very quick and dirty look at your data from Bayesian point of view, you can get that rather easily. There's five steps, and most of them are rather simple. The first one is, then this will all be based on the idea that we generate new data sets that to see if they're close to our observed data set and, uh, where, and which parameters generated those data sets. So this is what we're going to uh, try to put into code now. First of all, we need to be able to sample from our posterior distribution. So we get a proposal, that is what the PROC stands for, um, from our posterior, from, sorry, from our prior distribution. So first of all, we need to sample from the prior distribution. That was the PROC stands for. So I told you the prior is something big, and we can also choose it. So obviously, we'll choose something that we can easily sample from. As long as, as it is um, sufficiently big, that's totally OK. And often we choose normal distributions, uniform distributions, those kind of things. So in this case, um, maybe this is something standardized, like a, um, like a, a IQ test or something. Okay, that would have a different standard deviation. But let's think of something that is centered around 100. Um, and we say this is a normal distribution with sufficiently large standard deviation. So we get a proposal value for the, um, we get a proposal value that we sample from the prior. Now we need to generate a data set based on this very parameter. This might be a little bit of a tricky part because this very, very much depends on the application. But I assume that if you work in your field, you might already have a function that does that, that you get 
a parameter input and you generate a synthetic data set. My suspicion is that you might already have that or that it's not very hard for you as an expert in your field to get this function. So you get a new data set, a synthetic data set, based on this parameter. So this is our synthetic data. And what we now do is we need to talk about what it means for two data sets to be close. What we do in ABC often is that we choose summary statistics. Those are lower dimensional representations of our data. That sounds very fancy. When all we really say is, oh, it's some good values that we like. For example, the mean, the length. Think of it as the KPIs of the data set. In my example, in my work, for example, it often uh, turns out that the length is something that is really important. So this is what I've done here. We now have for the synthetic data set, we now have a new summary statistic that is based on a length. Now we need to compare this summary statistic with the summary statistic that we got from our actual data set Y. So it will be the length of the data set uh, minus the length of the synthetic data set. This is our distance. Um, you can do a lot of different things here. Um, often it works for it to be the absolute value. You can do an L2 norm, you can do a lot of different things, but to be honest, pretty much whatever sensibly you're picking here, it's gonna work. So now we're gonna get the distance. And all that's left to do is to say, if the distance is small enough, um, whatever this value might be in your applications, you accept the um, proposed theta, so the one that gave us the data set, as a draw from your posterior distribution, and you just attach it to the posterior distribution. You could just pick a value here as an epsilon, whatever small is good in your application, or you can just say, oh, I'll pick the best 10%. I'll let it run 10,000 times. I'll pick the test best 10%. So you will have to do those five things, put them in a for, lo for loop, and you're ready to do approximate Bayesian computation. A couple of things that I want to like mention before we wrap up here, and there's a lot of research going on in EBC, and it's quite a lot of fun because we get better at computation, there's different algorithms out there, but they all really do the same thing that I've just shown you. However, I think that the finding of the summary statistics so the length that I've used in my example is sometimes, sometimes downplayed in the literature, and it can actually be quite hard to find good summary statistics, especially when your parameters have a, um, are high dimensional. But nevertheless, ABC is a cool tool because it allows you to get very good approximations to the posterior distributions in cases where you can't or don't want to evaluate the likelihood. And as you can see, you only need five things to get a first secondary Bayesian look at your data. Easy to implement, but maybe it's a little hard to find summary statistics depending on your applications. But maybe while I was talking, you already have, already had some good ones in mind for you. As I, um, as, uh, I, I was mentioned earlier, I'm a PhD student at the School of Mathematics. In my research, this is all quite important. So I've used ABC for a paper that is currently under review and that you can find on the archive, where we deal with a special kind of point process. That is the Hoax process and that is often used in earthquake literature, for example. So this is a case where we cannot evaluate the likelihood. In my case, because we've got an infinite amount of integrals and we really don't want to deal with that. So this is where we use ABC. And generally, I'm currently working on a high dimensional Bayesian method. So everything that I talked about when, in the first part of the talk, when, uh, about the Bayesian things, about the prior specification, this is what I'm currently working on. If you thought this talk was interesting, I can highly recommend um, another great introduction to approximate Bayesian computation that was actually the first video I ever watched on ABC. Um, if you pop approximate Bayesian computation into YouTube, you'll find this video by Rasmus Bach, which is just brilliant, and it talks about socks, and it's a lot of fun. So altogether, I hope that this gave you a good introduction on Bayesian statistics, what it is, why it might be useful, and also a handy guide of how you personally could do ABC and hence Bayesian statistics in your work. Thank you very much for having me. I'm now really curious to hear your questions, your comments, your ideas, and so on and so forth. And if you wanna get in touch, feel, please feel free to do so even after the talk or if you're just watching on YouTube. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Bella. That was a very interesting talk. So, uh, as I mentioned, it'd be good to have uh, questions now, um, and we, we already have a few. So, the, the first question was uh, by Alan, Alan, and he was wondering about scalability. Uh, so, this is, this is clearly a big problem, especially in Bayesian statistics, where you use 
highly dimensional models because you're dealing with complex problems and stuff. So do you have any comment on, on the scalability of these methods? Yes, absolutely. So first comment, it's bad. It really is, especially if you're unlucky and generating new data sets is very expensive. Um, but the follow-up comment is it's getting better. So I presented a method that, that just lets you, or that starts off by sampling from the prior. This is a first way where you can make better proposals and you just need to correct a little bit. Um, it's not a big difference, but uh, it's making you, it's making it more efficient in the sense that you get more accepted proposals without, ha without compromising any of the algorithm. And on top of that, there's a lot of research done at the moment of how you can better use your samples, of how you can make better proposals, um, how you can maybe paralyze stuff. So it's not good, but it's getting better. Okay, thank you. I, I, I have a question and then we're moving on to another question. My question is, uh, so you mentioned Stan, uh, which is an example of a probabilistic programming language and um, they're, they are popping up like mushrooms these days, so that there's plenty of them. Um, another, another one that, that comes to mind that I, I do not know, but I've been bombarded with advertising on that is Nimble, uh, but there's plenty more. So I, I'm thinking, um, is there any other language that you are using uh, or that you would suggest looking into uh, if one were interested in learning how to implement these models? And, and do you know of any uh, interface with R that, that, that's uh, reliable, like uh, RSTAN and RSTAN ARM are for the star, uh, for the STAN language? Is that, is that in particular for the ABC application? Yeah, um, so I'm not aware of one. I'm not sure if probabilistic program languages are the right approach because we are trying to circumvent having to evaluate the likelihood. So we don't want to get into that whole probability thing anyway. In some cases, we don't even, we can't, we don't even know the likelihood, it's really difficult. I would think that maybe probabilistic programming languages are not the best fit because of the problem that we're trying to solve. Um, but I am aware though of other packages in R that are doing um, ABC and I'm not sure how versatile they are for your application, but I think that they might be giving you gains in, in, with, um, with respect to, I don't know, usability or something. But um, I'm personally, I'm. I'm used to doing it myself. <laughs> okay, thank you. There was another question by Ugur, uh, which was more about uh, the, the, the Bayesian uh, workflow. So he, he, was, uh, he, he said he did not quite get how the updating works. So if you could spend a few words on that, because it's, oh. it's a very crucial point. I mean, it's uh, maybe the main point of the whole philosophy. So, yeah. Oh, absolutely. So um, this is a great question, especially because I just left it out of the talk. Um, so what we do here, I'll maybe get one, two more slides back, is that um, the more data we collect, the more influence it will have on our prior. So that was um, when I was uh, um, getting to a posterior solution. Um, but in the end, what we need, what we know is that uh, those are all um, probability distributions, so they need to integrate to one, um, especially the posterior distribution. So what we are um, doing usually is that we write those down, um, and then if you remember the base theorem, there was a little bit more to it. So what we do is that we have to do the math and have to see what distribution we end up with if we multiply the prior and the data distributions together, and how we make sure that this actually is again integral to one or integrates to one. So there's quite some math involved here. Usually it starts by writing down and seeing what you end up with. Maybe it's a known distribution. There's uh, those things that um, if you have certain prior specifications, you know, for example, that if we choose a binomial model like the one I've got on the bottom and we use a beta prior, we get again a beta posterior and we, you can circumvent some of the um, of the calculations, that's quite handy. Um, but you don't need to do that. So this is where actually quite a, quite a lot of the um, stuff of the work is in Bayesian statistics to getting to that posterior distribution. And things like STAN that has been mentioned before here, 
is quite useful. It does all the work for you. It doesn't give you a closed form solution for the posterior. That is often not available, but at least it gives you samples and usually we're quite happy with that. Okay, thank you. There's, there's one last question that I uh, yeah. that, that, that want to, to relay you, uh, Ben. So Ben was wondering how accurate or complex does your sampling model has to be have to be to, to get good and accurate results. So can you use ABC to get rapid estimates with simplified models? Um, so is the simplified model here in your simulated data? Is that where you want to simplify? Uh, ben? Yeah, yes. Perfect. Uh, <laughs> yes, absolutely. Um, there is actually there is actually research in that very area. What if you do if your model is not that good? Well, if you so if it's not, if it's a little bit simplistic, so we know all models are wrong, some are useful, we know it. Um, if it's a little bit simplifying, I would say yes, go for it. Um, we always have to make assumptions and make some things not as elaborate as we'd like to be. Uh, have a go, see how it goes, yes. Um, but there is, so there is research on that and um, there is some research, give me a second, where we talk about indirect inference, which has some overlap with ABC, that talks about what do we do if our model is wrong. Okay, thanks, Bella. It was very, very a very question. interesting talk, and uh, let me thank you again for accepting our invitation to speak tonight. Thank you. Very um, much. All right, so I think we are ready for our next speaker. Uh, Flick, are you there? All right. Yep. So as I said earlier on, I will shamelessly read her bio because it's long. <laughs> she's, she's another speaker that has done a lot of stuff. So, uh, Flick is a research assistant in bioinformatics in the Wallace Lab within the Institute for Cell Biology at the University of Edinburgh. Uh, they work to understand how translation works within cells, in particular of fungi, and what factors control and regulate protein synthesis. Um, and she is part of the development team for the Ribovitz open source package uh, that deals with ribosome profiling data. And she works with colleagues from the University of Edinburgh to make code base more robust and sustainable. So she's, she has quite a lot of experience with coding as well. Uh, she has a background in ecology and botany and uh, has worked on a wide range of types of biological data using different tools and has been using particularly R for, for the past eight years. And she's also a member of the Edinburgh Carpentries and the Certified Com Carpentries in Structuring Foundational Coding and Data Science Skill for Researchers. Wow. <laughs> okay. Play this stuff. Flick, the, the, the floor is all yours. Thanks very much. I'll just share my screen. All right, um, let me just start off by saying that my slides are uh, generated, they're an HTML presentation, but generated using our markdown. And so if you're interested in finding out what that's like, um, you can check out the code for these slides using the bit.ly link at the, the bottom of each slide from the talk repository on GitHub. Um, so welcome to my section of the, the session today, putting the viz back into Ribovis. So I'm going to be talking about connecting a couple of different tools, specifically our Markdown, Shiny and Nextflow. You know all about me already, um, but feel free to click through if, you're, you're, if you want to know more. Um, so in outline, um, I'm going to tell you a little bit more about the Ribovis package that I'll be speaking more about today. Um, I'm going to answer the question, what on earth is a WFMS? Uh, spoiler alert, it's a workflow management system. Uh, and tell you a bit about Nextflow and R Markdown and how I went about trying to add a new feature to Ribovis, specifically to try and create some HTML output for our samples. Um, and then I'll go on to talk about what the next steps will be on the project and hopefully answer your questions at the end. So uh, as you've heard from my, my bio, Ribovis is some open source software which processes and analyzes ribosome profiling data. And ribosome profiling data is a type of sequencing data. Uh, this is a collaborative project with four labs, two of whom are based in Edinburgh, including EPCC and University of Edinburgh, and two labs over in the States. 
And the reason that researchers focus on ribosome profiling data is that it helps us unlock details of translation. And translation is basically the process by which a cell can create proteins from its genetic code. And Ribaviz as a, a, a software helps researchers do quality control checks and to understand characteristics of their experimental data. So if I grew a cell under two different conditions experimentally, how does this change how the cell translates these proteins? So the aim of spending some time developing the Ribavid software is to really let researchers spend more time addressing the biological questions. Um, so the aims are to apply software engineering techniques create more sustainable and robust and reliable code. In terms of inputs, we have quite a few. Um, we have some organism specific slides. Uh, apologies, um, I'm not feeling particularly well. So um, if I stop suddenly, then uh, just to let you know that I might need to step away. Um, I hope that's all right. Um, but if so, my, my slides are available. Um, so, Ribaviz has organism-specific inputs and sample-specific inputs, and those include our uh, sample read data, so that's the sequence data. And we basically list all of this information within a configuration file, which is a YAML file, and that's a text-based format. Um, as part of the workflow, there are a lot of different steps, as happens with many different types of sequencing pipeline. But the analysis step that we might be interested in, particularly as researchers, is where we can generate some summary data in TSV files and some plots in PDF. So these are a couple of examples of PDF outputs generated by RIPFIS. And we have quite a few different types, and we have up to eight different plots for each individual sample. And we might run several samples through Ribaviz as part of one data set. And you can imagine that trying to negotiate up to eight different PDFs for one sample, and then having to negotiate the same number for any other numbers of samples that you have, it gets quite difficult to manage. And there's a chance that you're going to struggle to figure out which sample you're looking at each plot for. Uh, and it's a bit of a nightmare when you're trying to figure out, did my data set run correctly? So the idea was to add a new step to our workflow process. And this step is an extra visualization step. So the plan was to take some of the data from these TSVs and to generate the same PDFs that are currently output by Ribaviz, but within one file for each sample as an HTML report, which means that you could then scroll through them quite happily. So before I talk about how I did this, I need to give you a bit more background on workflow management systems and specifically Nextflow, which is what we used. So in general, workflow management systems kind of provide uh, an infrastructure or a sort of exoskeleton, if you like, to set up and run and monitor uh, your defined set of tasks. So these are the different steps in your pipeline. Um, and sometimes they're referred to as processes. And typically, workflow management systems have common features. So they'll include some runtime management. And this is the infrastructure which supports how the pipeline tasks are split up and when they're run and allows you to parallelize these tasks. It also affords you the opportunity for some portability and reproducibility benefits. So I should expect the same results by running on different machines. If I'm running on my local computer, I want the same results from running Ribaviz on a computer cluster, for example. And I also can get some benefits in terms of troubleshooting, where I might have a rerun or reentrancy option and workflow management systems typically handle creating logging files. And another nice feature of workflow management systems is that by 
basically kind of encasing your pipeline in one script. This means that it's much more easy to share with other people and for them to see what steps are involved in your kind of workflow pipeline. And some examples that you might have heard of include SnakeMake particularly, um, but there's also Toil and CWL tool as well as Nextflow. And some of you might be thinking, why not just use a script? Why add this kind of extra level of complexity to a project that might already be quite complex? So RabbitViz previously was controlled by a Python script, and that script then ran the other scripts involved in our pipeline, so some in Bash, Python, and R. Um, but we found that as we added features to the pipeline and to RabbitViz, we ended up spending more of the development time on these sort of admin related tasks. So deciding when to run different steps of it or creating log files. And this is really when workflow management systems come into their own because they handle these tasks better. They can check your files exist, create those log files for you, and they can queue and run your tasks efficiently without you having to do any extra steps. And so we realized that rather than writing bespoke code to do these things ourselves and reinventing the wheel, we can use existing features of code that someone else has written, in this case, a workflow management system. And this allowed us to follow a scientific computing best practice. So this practice is reuse code instead of rewriting it. And in case you haven't come across this paper, the best practices for scientific computing, it's a really good resource to give you some great tips on how to make better code. And so in the end, we decided to use Nextflow rather than some of the others. Um, if you want to know more about how we went about that process or read more about using prototyping to decide between different workflow management systems, uh, our, our group actually produced a paper on doing just that which there's a link to in the slides. But effectively, we, we gained a lot of the benefits from, um, from workflow management systems in general, um, as well as being able to split up our tasks efficiently and run them based on whether their inputs were there. Um, this meant that tasks don't wait for unrelated tasks to finish just because of their order in a pipeline sequence. If we're running something for multiple samples, we can run all of those samples in parallel. And this saves time and it's more efficient. We also have a resume option. So if I'm testing a new data set on the cluster and something breaks because I didn't set the parameters quite right, then instead of having to rerun the whole pipeline, I can just rerun from the last successful checkpoint. And this is known as reentrancy. And this can save a lot of computing time, often hours, and obviously that has budget implications if you're paying for your compute time. Nextflow also has a simple syntax. So we were able to reuse the existing scripts we have rather than having to rewrite an entire code base, which is a big plus. And it has the option of adding containerization and using Conda. So in case you're interested, what a Nextflow process might look like in general, then we can define it um, in this kind of way. And the key parts are the input, output, and script. And we also have this when condition, which allows us to run the process or not based on a condition. But it's the inputs and the outputs that really let Nextflow decide when this particular process needs to run compared to others. If the inputs of this process aren't there yet, it'll have to wait until further down the chain. If this process is going to generate an output, which is the input of another process, then obviously this process has to happen first. And the script section is the code which will be executed during this process. So as our users, you may indeed be familiar with R Markdown already, but for those of you who are less familiar, it's a really powerful tool. Um, it lets you create a note notebook style document. So you can combine chunks of text, chunks of code, and markdown formatting into one glorious entity. So you can have your plots and your analysis of the data within the same document. This means I can share my code um, and conclusions based on that 
with my collaborators and they can then run and edit the analysis themselves. It also allows you to run chunks of code in different languages, so it gives you some real flexibility. If you prefer to do certain steps of your data work in one language over another, then you have that option. And I can feed it in parameters to this R Markdown document, so that lets me run it from the console. And it has a whole plethora of output formats. So I have some PDFs uh, options, I have HTML options, and I can create slideshows like this one. So if you remember, I was talking about the, the idea of wanting to add a feature where for each sample, I create an HTML output page with all of the existing plots that I currently generate from RiberViz as separate PDFs and let me scroll through it to compare them more easily. So this means I can keep track of which samples outputs I'm viewing, and it also will speed up the quality control process because I can open one document and at a glance see that my run has worked fine or there's something properly wrong in the data set. And it lets me communicate the outputs of different data runs between colleagues much more easily. So instead of having to build up a zip file with lots of different stuff that I've had to drag and drop, um, where I have the potential to include the same plot twice or not at all, then I can just share the HTML file for one sample, which is much easier. And this, this issue began development back in August. I haven't been working full time on it. Um, it. You would hope for more progress by now if I had, but it's certainly been quite a long one, and we've definitely learned a lot about how to integrate things with Nextflow and how to create these outputs as we've kind of been working on the development. So initially, I tried something kind of quick. I decided I would copy across the relevant calculation and plotting code into standard R Markdown code chunks. But this meant that suddenly I had twice as much code to maintain in terms of the analysis. So this leads immediately to the problem where there's the potential for divergence of code. If I make a change or an improvement in one set, then that might not necessarily end up in the other set, and then you have divergence. And because I'm still doing the calculation, I need to pass a lot of parameters into the R Markdown document via this YAML header. But it's really inefficient to run your calculation code twice if you don't have to. All I want are the plots. So in this case, running the main analysis script and then rerunning all that calculation in the R Markdown document isn't helpful. And this breaks the don't repeat yourself best practice. So next, I realized that you can actually run external chunks of code from your main analysis R script or any R script elsewhere from within an R Markdown file using this readchunk function in the NITR package. But I was still passing in a lot of parameters via the YAML section. I'm still calculating again. Um, but this time, because there's an extra layer of abstraction, it's difficult to make sure that the values were correct. And I'm still running that calculation twice, even though at least this time it's only from one location. And this meant that it was really difficult to problem solve when I had issues. Um, so an R Markdown error would refer to one line of code within the R Markdown document, but that would then refer to a larger block of multiple lines of code in the R script. And we're still breaking this, don't repeat yourself. So ultimately the solution that I came up with was to go back and do a bit of work on my plot functions. As they stood, they weren't just plotting, they were doing a little bit of data wrangling on top. And that meant that they didn't have this principle of cohesion that's really important when you're writing good code. So I edited them so that the plot functions would only plot, no data wrangling. And then what I did was I changed how we're generating the TSV files to create the data that would then be used for plotting so that all the data wrangling had happened before those were generated. Then I created a new Nextflow process and I call it static HTML so that I could plumb in this R Markdown feature to our Nextflow pipeline. This 
new process would then pass the correct parameters from Nextflow into the R Markdown command. And once we run that, then the command will run the R Markdown document in which we load those TSV files, we load that data, and then use the plot functions, which will now just plot to generate the graphs and then output an HTML page for each sample. So this was great. This meant we're not doing that double calculation again. We're just loading data and plotting it. And we have far fewer parameters to handle. Now, this I, I included this as to give you an idea of what uh, a slightly abridged next flow process for doing something complicated can look like. It looks complicated, but it is sort of a complicated process. But we still have the same features. We've got these inputs. So in this case, our configuration file, something to tell the process which sample we're working on, and then the TSB files, which contain the data we we'll use to generate those plots. We're telling Nextflow that it's gonna generate an HTML file. And I created a new parameter for the configuration file so users can decide whether they want to run this process to generate those reports or not. And this is really kind of the heart of the, the process here, this shell section. So what it's doing is creating a variable called script. And the first thing that's going into that is the R markdown render command, which will run my R markdown document. And then each of these following lines is just appending a little section of that command. So we're adding parameters line by line. So this is the configuration file, the sample information, an example of data files. So in, in our case, we had some conditional files and we had some that would always be there. So we have one that would always be there and we have one that might be there based on something. And also a couple of extra arguments to the render command here. And line 668 here is the part that really runs this. So we're, we've assembled our script, which is sort of substituted here, and we're running it in R using this. And in case you're curious what the R Markdown document looks like, I won't take you through the whole thing, but if you're not familiar with the YAML header section, this is what one looks like. We have a document title and some information about the output, including our table of contents that we're gonna generate. And these are the parameters that the R Markdown document is expecting to receive. So these will be passed in through from Nextflow. And then further down, this is us loading and reading that TSV data. And then further yet, we're plotting it. So in this way, we have code that's much easier to read and it's easy to tell which functions are being used. We're not repeating any blocks of code and we're not double calculating anything. And this is generating the required output, which is the best safe scenario. So as an example, this is what one of our current reports looks like. We have sample information, we have a little bit of provenance, we have a lovely table of contents, which lets you skip to a particular plot if you just can't wait to scroll down, and we have the plots themselves. So that was our feature successfully added, but what's the next step? Uh, and the next step is to make it shiny. So our current outputs in HTML are static. So this means that if our data files update, then those HTML outputs won't update magically uh, unless we rerun that process. And they don't move. We just have to see the same plots each time. But Rutgers team, who are part of the RibeViz project, have been working on developing some code in Shiny, which means that we can generate interactive plots. So a user can then decide to select particular samples or particular plots to view. Um, for, you, for those of you who aren't familiar with Shiny, it's a package in R which lets you build interactive web apps without having to get too kind of tangled up in like web app development stuff, which is great. If you know R already, then you're most of the way there to being able to use Shiny. But one of the things that we discovered trying to create this new feature is that you can't run Shiny code as part of an Expo workflow. And the reason for this we found out is that because you're effectively, when you run the shiny code, 
you're kicking up a server which runs so that the user interface is available and the user can then select different samples or view different plots and it's waiting for interactivity this server continues to run and while that's running it doesn't let the next flow process actually complete successfully so this in effect would break our workflow and so the way we came up with to get around this is to generate a helper script from Nextflow. And so what this does is it lets users generate a script which contains the shiny run command, including the correct inputs and file paths, which are added in from Nextflow. It doesn't run it, but it generates it. So that kind of solves our problem. And this is sort of a prototype for what that process is looking like at the moment. Um, it's pretty much the same structure. We have the input, which is the configuration file. And our output is the, this shell script. And within that script, we're, we're generating in the same way, just appending line by line, this sort of this command where we're running the shiny code and we're giving it a parameter, which is this configuration file. And we're just echoing that into the file, which is really quite simple. So what this means is that now a user can run RivaBiz as normal. The workflow um, within Nextflow will complete. So you have all of that good stuff. And then it's generating this, this file. The user can decide if, if the time is right and they're not working on a headless machine like a cluster, then they can decide to execute this helper script, which will then run the shiny code, which means that they have access to then these interactive visualizations to play around with. So we haven't quite finished the shiny code. There's still new plots to add and some kind of tweaks around interactivity to do. But the way that we've put this together means that users now have a no editing required option to be able to create interactive plots based on all the analysis outputs that RivaBiz generates. And this means that they can explore their data and view particular samples and plots that will be of interest to them, which is really exciting. So as a, an example of the kinds of output we might have in there, uh, users can select particular samples to view. So then for each sample, you can see that there, and they can decide which types of plots they want to see. So what I've learned from the overall process is that although you can call chunks of code from that live outside an R Markdown document from within it, you probably shouldn't. Like the troubleshooting alone meant that it was more hassle than it was worth. There's probably good examples why you might want to do that, but this was definitely not one of them. I also find it quite difficult getting to grips with the file paths um, kind of initially during the prototyping stages for, for this feature. But once I had started integrating things with Nextflow and figured out how Nextflow refers to files and handles paths, then that made it much, much easier. And it's been a really useful reminder of why you should make sure your functions are cohesive in that they do only one thing um, rather than doing plotting and something else when you just expect them to plot. And I've definitely learned that it's really, really important to stick to this don't repeat yourself or others principle. We had ended up going down the path of trying to create code that would effectively reinvent the wheel and create logging files when actually moving to a workflow management system was the right choice because it meant we could refocus our development time into features which would actually benefit the biological stuff. And um, figuring out about not repeating chunks of our code and why that was a bad idea was was also uh, really interesting. Um, but I, I think the most interesting thing I learned was that Shiny won't run in your next flow pipeline. And I really wasn't expecting that. I thought it would all just be a seamless, magical experience. But actually, the way that we've kind of framed this workaround means that next flow still does a really useful job in helping us to generate that, that command, and it's still helping with the file and parameter admin, which might be tripping us up otherwise. So I'd like to thank the, the different teams involved on the RiveViz project. It's, it's been a really fun project to be involved with. So there's a few people at the Wallace Lab in Edinburgh, 
and also across at EPCC, but also two teams from over in the States. Um, and I'd like to ask any questions. I'll just stop sharing for now. Thank you, Flake. Uh, do you feel like taking yeah. questions? Are you yes, yes that, that's fine. Thanks very much. Okay, so we, we do have a few questions, actually, some from, from us and some from the audience here. So, um, Bella is asking, what was the process to find out you needed the helper script for Shiny? And uh, she wonders whether this is well documented or you had to dig deep into Stack Overflow and, <laughs> and things like that. Um, basically, it was, we, we went up a couple of different alleys of trying to, to figure out, because you can do Shiny code in an R Markdown file. So we, we started off trying that. It just wasn't working. Um, and so we, I think we tried a couple of things and we ran into errors, which didn't seem to make sense. Um, but the more we, we kind of looked into it, the more we realized that, first of all, it, doesn't, it didn't seem like many people were trying to do this exact thing in Nextflow. Um, so we, we, we didn't run into many other people who were like, oh, no, I tried and failed. Um, and, and here's what worked in the end. So this helper script thing was something that we kind of came up with the idea ourselves because we, we started to, to effectively generate a command as part of the work that we did to create this HTML output. And so we, we kind of, it was a bit of a natural progression for us to go, well, actually, in order to run the Shiny script, we need to generate a command which will have some parameters. So we can just use the same process, but just not try and run it um, and leave that to the user to be able to do when it's most effective for them. Uh, so I, I hope that answers the question. We didn't really find many other um, people's uh, attempts to, to, to do that and then documentation of it. It was more of a, we tried different things and this is what we, we found worked. Uh, thanks. Uh, and, I, and related, I, I was wondering how tailored to Ribovitz this is. So how difficult it would be to actually implement this for another package and in another? Um, I, I suppose it really depends on, on you know, the, the state of the code for, for that package. But I guess the approach is probably one you can take more generally. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, Nextflow is, is one of the things that I've, I've found with it is that it is really quite general and has a lot of really wide use cases. And it has a lot of flexibility, which means you can try different things. Um, and usually one of them will, will be exactly what you need. So I, Again, it, it depends on the specifics, but if anyone's thinking of something particular, then like please feel free to get in touch, and I'm I'm happy to to tell you kind of what we tried and, and what worked and what didn't. I'm by no means am I an expert on Nextflow, but I have spent quite a while trying to to mess around with getting different things to work. So um, I'm happy Thanks. to to get in touch with people. Um, I'll, I'll get to a couple more questions quickly. Um, so Ben and Alan is asking, is there a way, is there not a way to use, for example, NoHub to kick off Shiny in the background, though killing it later might be more involved? Um, so I, there probably, uh, undeniably, there will be a way to do complicated things to, to get things running. but. Thinking about the researchers who are likely to use this, many of them are wet lab specialists. Like if you hand them a pipette, they are a wizard, but they're just using this pipeline as a means to understanding their data. So we're not necessarily aiming this at people with like extreme technical background in terms of, of managing lots of different things outside of running a command. Um, so. The, there was also a problem with the fact that often we're running Rabbivis on a cluster, and so it might not be possible to actually generate a, a, a server process and open a browser because you might not have access to that. Um, if you just want to, to look at it later, then I think this, this helper script that lets you do that in, in the right area is, uh, is definitely worthwhile. Um, so yes, uh, it's probably possible, but I think that for for this case and for thinking about the users particularly, um, it was much simpler to, to just decide, let's give them the recipe um, and let them press go when it suits them 
rather than trying to do something more involved. That makes sense. And there's a last question from Ben, and then I'll let you all run free, um, which is about Nextflow, actually. So is Nextflow something, uh, some you can include for even simple workflows, or do you need some level of complexity to justify it? Is there an overhead cost that uh, you, you feel would not be? Um, so I suppose in terms of overheads, if you're thinking about how fast something will run, that I definitely I can answer too. Um, but Nextflow is something that you can use in very simple scenarios. So if you had a, a very small pipeline or something that, that isn't too complex, it should work just as well for that. I guess in, in that case, the overhead is how long it will take you to get used to Nextflow and how to, to build your pipeline. Although we found that actually one of the reasons we chose Nextflow is that it has a really good community and there's a lot of really well-developed documentation. So um, we, we found it much easier to like find help for particular issues when we were implementing it compared to some of the other options that we looked at and might have used. Um, so I would say it's definitely worth having a look if you think that it sounds like this might answer some of your questions or, or even be of particular interest to, to have a go with. Um, and I'm happy if you want to, to get in touch and I can point you in the direction of, of some specific resources that I've found. Okay, that's great. Thank you very much, Flick. So on my side, I would first of all to thank the, the two speakers for two very, very interesting talks. This was a very interesting meetup. And um, besides, we are always on the lookout for, for speakers, as you know. So if you have something to tell us that you want to, to share, just get in touch through either Twitter or, or other social media. Or now we also have this Matrix channel that Greg wants to spend a couple more words on.